Welcome to Crosswords, the podcast about practical Christianity. What does it look like to walk in Jesus' footsteps? How do I live in a culture hostile to godliness? These are questions that we'll answer on each podcast as we get our heart and mind on Jesus. All scriptures quoted are from the New International Version. You can follow me on Twitter at Kingdom underscore Saint. Walk with the Lord today and be a blessing. This is episode 8 of Prayers in the New Testament. This one is found in 2 Thessalonians 1, 11 through 12. And this is a prayer to God to bring to fruition our desire for goodness and our deeds prompted by faith. We read in 2 Thessalonians 1, 11 through 12. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and that by his power he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm very encouraged by our young people in the church. I'm encouraged by their prayers full of hope and conviction. I see their desire to change and not want to embrace the folly of humanism or scientism, remaining stuck in the doubt and fears generated in their hearts. I know they don't want to be like the world they see, where lies and manipulation are the way of life. I know God is blessing them with fruit as many of their friends have come to see what kind of power is working in their life, the power of the Holy Spirit, an unearthly power. And I pray they may come to know that power in the forgiveness of sins provided by Jesus Christ. Keep up the good work, young people, in the colleges, in the universities, in the high school. God has called you to this hope in Jesus, and he's making you worthy of his calling. So Paul's prayer here is focused on our response to the calling of the gospel. Paul doesn't doubt God will finish the work he started. So his encouragement is for the brethren to remain steadfast in his calling, not to give up. He says, by his power, we will bear fruit. God's mercy has enabled us to receive his power by the work done by Jesus on the cross. That's why Paul says, we constantly pray for you that God may make you worthy of his calling and that by his power he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed. See, it's by his power that these things will happen. The two permanent problems mankind has that made us unworthy of God's calling were sin and death. And they've been resolved by Jesus' sacrifice. By his sacrifice, sin has been paid for you, and therefore the second death is now voided for you if you accept his sacrifice of sin. That's why the Hebrew author will say in Hebrews 10, 19 through 20, we have confidence to enter the most holy place by Jesus' blood, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is, his body. When Jesus gave up his body as a sacrifice for our sins, we have opportunity to receive power from God by the Spirit in this life, which is what guarantees us the life to come. This new and living way it talks about here is entered when we make a commitment to make Jesus our Lord and Savior by believing in the work he did for us and when we're baptized for the forgiveness of sins. According to Acts 2.38, When we're baptized, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the power of God that we're now experiencing in our life's choices that will affect our eternal choices. The power, as Paul says in this prayer in 2 Thessalonians, that by his power, he may bring to fruition. That's the power that's going to make us fruitful in the choices that we make 
and in the desires that we want to have. Now, that being said, there is a process that we must endure with great patience. He speaks here of two things. Our every desire for goodness, God will bear make that fruitful, and also our every deed prompted by faith. So there is a desire that we need to grow in, that we need to mature, and there are deeds that we need to do. Let's first talk about the desire for goodness that God wants to make fruitful. As you grow in this new and living way, you will have the power and you need to turn your desires to God towards what is good. In the last prayer we examined, Paul expressed his prayer for their love, the Christian's love, to increase and overflow. This is a call for the agape love that comes from God and overflows from our lives to the lives of others. This is a desire to do good things, to be used for good, to have our minds dwell on good. And you won't be able to do this on your own because we are so easily deceived and easily distracted by the forces of evil all over this life with things that toy with our passions, with our interests. Oftentimes we feel helpless against this worldly tide that flows over us. And this requires tremendous power, unearthly power. But that's a power that Christians have through the Holy Spirit. Often our thoughts can be very selfish. We are very self-centered. We're always thinking about what we want, what's bothering us, what we don't like, what we want to do. And the thoughts of the flesh are very, very self-centered and often very negative. And sometimes we get ruled by a negative mindset. And this turns to us becoming bitter, becoming discontent. And it's going to require self-sacrifice, self-denial. And that's powered by the Spirit to turn our desires for good. And this is going to be reflected first in how we talk to one another. And then that will translate in action. That's why Paul tells the Philippians in Philippians 4.8, he says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That's where our mind needs to dwell on these things. And it's a, we have to force our mind to do that because we get lost in the worldly tide that flows over us. But Paul also says in Romans 8, 5 through 8, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. So it depends where you want to live. Do you want to live pleasing the flesh, or do you want to live pleasing the Spirit? He'll say in Romans 8, 6, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. When your mind is bitter, discontent, when your thoughts are negative, That's your mind telling you, hey, man, you're being governed by the flesh here. All you got to look forward to is death. But if your mind is being governed by the spirit, then you have to look forward to life, to peace. He'll then go to say in Romans 8, 7, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. But then he goes on to say in Romans 8, 10 through 11, but if Christ is in you, and this is the hope for those of us who've chosen to be identified with Christ, who've been baptized and received forgiveness, received the power from above, he says, if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Wow, that is a lot of hope. And so therefore, we are able to now capture those thoughts that get distracted 
by our fleshly passions or by the distractions of the world, by the power of Christ, we're able to capture those thoughts and submit them to Christ and turn our thoughts to the positive things so that we can be in step with the Spirit as opposed to being in step with our flesh. So God wants us to bear fruit. We already spoke of how he wants by his power to bring to fruition our every desire for goodness. So let's talk about that second part, that second process, how he wants to bring to fruition our every deed prompted by faith. You see, as you grow in this new and living way when you become a Christian, you need to do things by faith. You will have the power to discipline yourself to walk by faith instead of by sight. And it first begins by putting all our desires into goodness, into doing good things, into thinking about good things then we will be able to walk by faith. And what does that look like? Well, not participating in activities that may undermine our commitment to God's kingdom. If I'm not here every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Friday, when we meet together, how will I be able to spur one another on towards love and good deeds? Oftentimes, this also looks like taking a lower paying job over a better paying job to be worthy of his calling. Let me explain myself. When I was working, when I first graduated from college and I started to apply for jobs, there were lots of jobs out there, some of them with great salaries that made me salivate. And I was like, wow, I didn't know I could make this much. But when I interviewed and realized the kind of commitments they were expecting of me and and the sacrifice of time I had to sacrifice some Sundays and some weekends maybe some Wednesday nights in other words that it was uh, taking over the time that I was supposed to be devoting to God and I said whoa wait a minute this is very tempting but this is not going to help me walk by faith it's not going to promote a desire for goodness and good deeds prompted by faith. So I started to look at other jobs that perhaps were a little less, but that's because they had that flexibility with the schedule. My goal was to put the kingdom first, as Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33. Put his kingdom and his righteousness first, and then all these other things will be given to you as well. We have to trust God in that process. God knows what we need. Sometimes we're trying to take care of ourselves, trying to take care of number one. And that results in not taking care of our spiritual needs at all. And then we become bitter, discontent, frustrated with our lives. But if we put God first, we are going to be an active participant in the kingdom and that's how we are made worthy of his calling. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 advise us to let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Apparently, that was a problem back in the first century as well. Some people giving up meeting together because life gets in the way, you know, stuff happens. But if we're not prioritizing our spiritual needs and our relationship with God, easily the worldly flow of distractions is going to be more than we can bear. But my deeds prompted by faith will bear fruit as I consider how I spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And I also receive that encouragement from others. If I only do things according to how I feel or what I see, which is not walking by faith, then I'm going to lead myself down a path of bitterness, a path of hurt, a path of pain. That's the wide road that leads to destruction. Paul tells the Philippians in Philippians 2, 12 and 13, he says, continue to work out 
your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. There's a purpose God has for you. You might not know it. You might think you know what it is, but unless you're surrendering to him in this process of turning your every desire for goodness and every deed towards faith, you won't know what it is. And it is God who you need to let work in you how to will and act in order to fulfill his good purpose. You have to trust him. You have to trust your church leaders, trust your mentors, trust your brothers and sisters when they lovingly rebuke you and teach you. Because God is using his whole village, the church, to point us towards that direction so that we can become fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And then what Paul says at the end of this prayer here in 2 Thessalonians 1, uh, verse 12, he says, We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus will be glorified in us and we in him by God's grace when we surrender to this process and by his power we are brought to fruition, our, our desires for goodness, our deeds prompted by faith. All this enduring will bear fruit. By God's grace, by the power of the Spirit, life will be given to our mortal bodies on that day when Jesus is revealed to all. He will be glorified in us and we in him. As Paul tells the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 10, he says, This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who don't know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. And this includes you, because you have believed our testimony. This is such a great verse to help us wait in expectation to know that all this work that we're enduring and that we're giving ourselves over to is not in vain because God is working out a purpose. And we don't want to end up, see, we've been giving a treasure, a gospel to help people know God and not just know God, but obey the gospel. It's not just about knowing about God, but there is a message that needs to obey it. As he says here in 2 Thessalonians 1.8, Jesus is going to come, and when he is revealed, people who don't know him and haven't obeyed the gospel are not going to have a good end. They are going to suffer punishment because they didn't choose Jesus, so they weren't made worthy because there is nothing in us that makes us worthy. What makes us worthy is the blood of Christ. So if we don't know God and we haven't obeyed the gospel, there is nothing on our side. We will be shut out from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his might. We won't be amongst those who are marveling at Jesus when he comes because they believed. So we want to make sure we're carrying this good news to other people, letting them know that there comes a day that they can only be prepared for by knowing God and by obeying his gospel. Thank you very much for listening. I hope the Lord gave you insight into conforming to Jesus with today's message. I always appreciate feedback. You can send me your thoughts, musings, and comments directly through the Anchor app. You can also contact me on Twitter at Kingdom underscore Saint. Walk with the Lord today and be a blessing.